Okay, so the bulk of this lesson has come from our live thing when we actually ran our experiments, whether that was in class or I'm recording this right now in 2020, so whether that ends up being online for the coming school year. But we've already done some sort of experiments based on our pulse rates. And I am recording this video before we've actually done the experiment, so I don't know exactly how things played out right here. So I'm gonna talk in kind of a generic sense about one type of experiment I've done before, but it should still be helpful to hear how this is organized, even if we did something slightly differently. If you're like, oh, this isn't helpful, you're talking about a different thing than we actually did in class, skip till the ends where I talk about statistical, statistical significance, because that's the most important part of this lesson. So generally in class, I don't do the caffeine problem. It's um, kind of a hassle to get it all set up and get the caffeine poured and I run to the grocery store to get the caffeine and kids sometimes aren't comfortable drinking soda in class. So it's just, I found that it's better to do other things to measure pulse rate instead. So one thing that I've done, which is what I'm gonna run with in this example, is I can look at whether physical exercise increases pulse rate, which increases pulse rate which seems obvious that it would, but it's still kind of nice to do something and to see results that actually are significant. So let's say for my problem right here, what I'm gonna run with, again, we may have done something differently in class, I don't know yet, I can't see into the future, but what I'll generally do is something with exercise. So I'm gonna do three groups here to be real fancy with it. We're gonna have no exercise at all, we're gonna have a group that does 60 seconds of jumping jacks. And we're gonna have a group that does 60 seconds of push-ups. And then we're gonna see between those groups if there is a difference in the pulse rates before and afterwards. So let's talk about, I'm not gonna have you necessarily write these, but think about how we can make sure each of these four principles of experimental design is addressed within the context of this study. So think about that for a second, then I'll talk my way through it right now. Comparison. I've got three separate groups, and I'm going to compare my pulse rates between the three groups. That's great. I've done that, and I need to do that, because if I didn't, I wouldn't know if the change I saw was because of the exercise or because of something else going on, like my lesson, et cetera, et cetera. So I've talked about before, um, having different groups that have all gone through the same stuff is important. I can't just have everybody do the same exercise. The next thing I would need to do is have random assignment. So in my class, hypothetical class of 18 kids right here, I would randomly assign six kids to each, that's an arrow, six kids to each of those three groups. Um, and I would make sure I did it randomly. So like all the kids who are in the same sports don't end up in the same group and they're more fit than everybody else and stuff like that. So by randomly assigning even amounts to each of my groups, I'm ensuring that my groups aren't inherently unbalanced, which prevents confounding from occurring. Control. So with control, I wanna keep everything else the same. So one way of doing that, the other two groups with jumping jacks and push-ups are like getting up out of their chairs and doing things. I should probably have my no exercise kids get up and stand up anyway. So it's not like they're still sitting in a chair chilling. They're still doing something. Um, if I just had them sitting there, then I wouldn't know, maybe just by simply getting up, there is a difference being caused. Um, I'm recording this video summer of 2020, so I still don't know yet in 2020 if my kids are going to be with me in class when we do this lesson or if we're going to do this virtually. So this experiment, if we're doing it from our own homes virtually, would be terrible in terms of control because there are so many things that are different in your house versus your house versus your house. So if we are doing this virtually, my experiment had no control at all. Even if we're in class, I want to make sure, like I said, my one group gets to like still stand up, so that's going on. Um, I shouldn't have one group in like a hotter part of the room or out in the hallway where the temperature might be different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Make everything the same that I can. And finally, replication. Six people per group is not great. I'm not making any scientific journals with this amount of data right here, but I don't really have control over that in my problem. I can't influence the number of people I have. So my replication is not ideal going in. All right, so those are kind of how I am addressing or not addressing my experimental design. 
And I could make a little diagram again, but I've done that before. I don't really want to have you guys write one of these whole deals. The idea is, again, I would take my 18 people and I would randomly assign six of them to each treatment. So random assignment. You have six here, six here, six here. I said I didn't want to do it, but it looks like I'm kind of doing it anyway. These people can get treatment one, which is no exercise. These people can get treatment two, which is the jumping jacks. And then these people can get treatment three, which is push-ups. It doesn't matter which I call each of these because people were randomly assigned. So as long as I don't like look at the people in the groups and then decide what they get, it's okay that these are in any order. But after I actually do the exercise, then what I'm going to do with each of the groups is I am going to measure the pulses and then I'm going to compare my treatment groups. See if there's a difference between the push-up group and the um, jumping jack group and the no treatment at all group. And that's basically how my experiment's going to run. So um, generally, when I do these in class, it works a little better with exercise than it used to with caffeine. With caffeine, I would rarely see a difference between the groups, probably because I wasn't giving enough caffeine and I wasn't doing a good enough job controlling. It's actually very hard to execute a good experiment where other things don't come into play. There's always things that pop up that, well, that kind of messed with my results. So it takes a lot of deliberate thoughts, more than I put into this, to get good um, results from an experiment. But let's do a hypothetical here. So again, I don't know what happened when you actually did the experiment with me, but just like before, I'm gonna have a graph for the change in pulse rates, and I'm gonna have zero here at the middle. So I have my dot plots kind of stacked on top of each other so you can see what's going on. We're gonna have our no exercise, we're gonna have our jumping jacks, and we're gonna have our push-ups. Let's say my no group, hypothetically looked like this. So those are my six people right there. And then let's say my jumping jacks group hypothetically looks like this. And then my push-up group looks like this. Just making stuff up right here. In this situation, if I were to look at these results, what you want to look for is little overlap. If you have lots of overlap between your groups, it's not really convincing that there's a difference between this and this. If you see lots of separation between the groups, that does suggest that maybe there's a difference. So if I were to look at no exercise versus jumping jacks, fair amount of separation right there, not too much overlap. Same with no exercise versus push-ups. So in my hypothetical right here, I would say no versus either jumping jacks or push-ups, there is little overlap. And little overlap means there probably could be a difference. Meanwhile, if you look at jumping jacks versus the push-ups group, Jumping jacks versus push-ups have a lot of overlap in them. Yes, these people right here are higher than anybody in the push-up group, but there's an awful lot of overlap between these. So this has lots of overlap. And in general, when there's lots of overlap, we're not convinced of a difference. So that is what you want to look for in a nutshell when you're doing these. Is there lots of overlap or is there not? And this is so much more complicated, like they're not complicated, but complex than I'm making it up to be right now. We will talk a lot, a lot, a lot this year about deciding whether results are statistically significant. This is like our introductory chapter, just kind of dip our toes in the water aspect of this. Look to see if there's separation between your groups or not. And we will revisit this many times over the course of our time together in AP Stats. So based on the results of the experiment, is there evidence that the, one of the groups has increased pulse rates? And then I'm going to say again, I'm just going to write down a reminder to look for overlap. We want to see if there is overlap or not. 
And then assuming there is a difference between the two groups, or the we have three groups here, what are the possible explanations? This is getting at some of that more complicated stuff that we will address a lot more as class progresses here. But anytime you see a difference, there are two possibilities. Option one is there actually is a difference caused by the treatments. So it's possible that I saw a difference between jumping jacks and no exercise because the jumping jacks actually did cause a difference. The second option is sometimes a little harder for kids to understand. There is no difference. So there's no real difference. And the results occurred by chance. My face is in the way there, sorry. So by chance. Um, technically, the chance is due to random assignments. So by chance, due to random assignments. So let me explain what that means. And I don't want to do a super ton with this right now because we will hit this again later in future chapters, in future lessons. But let's say I had my no group that was like this and I had my um, jumping jacks group that was like this. There's a lot of separation there. So this would lead me to believe, wow, all these people did better than all of these people. That happened probably because the jumping jacks made a difference. It's especially apparent if you have only a little bit of data. So let's say I took the same problem, but I had four people in my study, two per group. So I had these two kids right here for, actually, let me put him closer to zero, her closer to zero. So I got my two people right here for this group, and I got my two people right here for this group, okay? When you have too little data, the chances are like, okay, maybe this person right here, their pulse rate was gonna go up either way, no matter what group they got put in. They just happened to get put in this group by random chance. If they got put in the no group, they still would have increased the same amount because that was just destined to happen anyway. So when you have too little data, you can make the argument that the results you're seeing are because of where people were randomly assigned and not because of the treatment itself. That is largely fixed by having enough data and seeing enough separation in what's going on. But that's the basic idea going on right there. All right. So the last thing we need to talk about, how can we determine if the evidence is convincing? The evidence is considered convincing if we can replicate it, if we can do it again and again and again. So we can do this through replication or in other words, repeated trials. So that is what it takes to be able to decide that results are convincing. You do it again and see if the same thing happens. You can actually conduct the experiments again, or you can do something called a simulation like we saw on the first day of school. And we will practice this a super ton between now and May. Now, results, last thing here, results are considered statistically significant if they are unlikely to occur due to chance. So results are statistically significant. Important vocab concept we will talk about a lot in this class. They're significant if they are unlikely to occur by chance. So if I were to deal out my groups again and not reproduce my results right here, it may be that it, the results I saw the first time were just due to the chance of how things were assigned. So you have to be able to repeat the process and do it again to see if it's due to chance or if it's actually due to the treatment that you impose. 